Ezekiel is unique for several reasons. I mean, he prophesied in Babylon. That's a little bit different. He conveniently dates several of his oracles. Thank you, Ezekiel. And um, unlike many of the prophets, the majority of the prophets who speak in poetic oracles, not Ezekiel. Ezekiel communicated mostly in prose. So he told parables and he argued case studies and he performed sign acts. Now, these sign acts, um, they're pretty fun to read. I'll, I'll admit that, but I doubt they were fun to perform. So here in chapters four and five, we got a batch of Ezekiel's initial uh, sign act judgment, where God tells Ezekiel to build a little mini city, a, a little mini Jerusalem, and then um, make uh, siege works go up against the city and build a battering ram um, and communicate to the exiles that this is what's going to happen to Jerusalem in just a few number of years. Babylon is coming. Okay, maybe that sign act would have been fun, but I doubt the next one would have been. God calls Ezekiel to lay on his side for 390 days. And this is supposed to signify the 390 years of, um, of punishment for the house of Israel, and then 40 years for the house of Judah. Um, and this 390, it, it, it's kind of hard to uh, determine just what it is referring to. Probably um, those years started with the initial division of um, Israel and Judah after Solomon's reign. Well, this is actually quite interesting. So the time between Ezekiel's first vision and his second vision in chapters 8 through uh, 11 is uh, I think it's something like 413 days, which gives Ezekiel just enough time to uh, perform his, his sign act here of laying on his side. So as you can tell, we have vision, judgment, vision, judgment here in this first um, packet, uh, this first section of Ezekiel. So um, 390 days, he, he's got just enough time to, uh, to perform this little sign act. And God says, hey, you know what? While you're laying on your side, I want you to cook your food over poo. Um, yeah, I'm not going to describe that because that's that's what's going to happen for the uh, the remnant still in Jerusalem when they are besieged. That's what they're going to be forced to do. Well, when you finish that, once you've completed your days of um, of laying on your side, you're probably going to need a haircut. Uh, let me show you what I mean. Ezekiel's kind of fourth sign act in this section. So uh, here we are in chapter five. It says, um, once you've finished, when the days of your siege are completed, scroll up a little bit, when you have completed the days of your siege, when you have completed these, well, what are you supposed to do? Well, it's time for a haircut. Let's go down to chapter five here. Um, use a barber's razor and pass it over your, your head and your beard, cut off your hair, and then put your hair into three different piles. Um, put the first pile inside of that little mini city of yours, okay? Um, and then strike a match and light that hair on fire. That's what's gonna happen to a third of the people back in Judah. Another third, scatter, um, uh, your hair around the outside of the city. Um, put your hair in three piles, scatter some on the outside of the city, and then take a sword and slash at that hair around the outside of the city because a third of the Judeans are going to die from the Babylonians as they're attempting to flee from the city. And then take another third pile of your hair and throw it up to the wind. <sighs> scatter it to, uh, to the wind, signifying the exile, the removal of a third of the Judeans to Babylon in 586. <clears throat> well, once you've completed all of this, your year of sign acts, um, you're gonna make an announcement to the people. You're gonna say here in chapter seven, the end has come. The end has come for you. And that is the day of the Lord, the day of the wrath of Yahweh, his judgment against uh, Jerusalem has arrived. And the result of this day of the Lord, this judgment, um, it will produce you uh, this knowledge of Yahweh. You will know that I 
am Yahweh. This is a critical phrase for Ezekiel. Look at this. Let's jump to chapter 7. We got the day of the wrath of Yahweh. The day has arrived. The day has arrived. And what will be the result? Look in green. You will know that I am the Lord. You will know that I am the Lord. Um, and this phrase, critical in Ezekiel, it's repeated 70 times. Now tell me, um, do you think the number 70 is significant? Mm, I kind of think that it is. Well, this phrase, you will know that I am the Lord, actually has its roots in the book of Exodus. Um, this is Yahweh's contest um, with Pharaoh. Um, so remember, Moses and Aaron, they go before Pharaoh and they say, I will multiply signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. And then the Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh. So first plague, water turned into blood. By this, you will know that I am Yahweh. Second plague, frogs, so that you will know that there is no one like Yahweh, our God. Fourth plague, flies, that you may know that Yahweh is in the midst of the earth. Well, the great irony in the book of Ezekiel is that the hand of Yahweh, his, the hand of its judgment, it's not against Egypt, but it's against his own covenant people who have violated the covenant for centuries. Well, <clears throat> it also takes place in the book of Exodus that Yahweh takes up residence um, among his people. And remember, Moses constructs the tabernacle and Yahweh enters, his glory enters into that tabernacle. Well, that is going to change in chapters 8 through 11. So after Ezekiel's year of Sinax, he's going to have his second vision, um, 592, his temple vision. Um, and this is, it's actually kind of funny. It says that the Spirit of God um, takes up Ezekiel by a lock of his hair, he's, he's in Babylon, remember, and brings him to Judah and takes him before the, the temple. And he basically gives Ezekiel a tour of what's going on back in Jerusalem while Ezekiel is doing all these crazy sign acts in Babylon. Um, and this tour that he receives, uh, it's, it's in four different areas within the temple complex. Let's go to chapter 8 and, and kind of follow Ezekiel on this temple tour. All right, we're in Exodus 8. We want to be in Ezekiel 8. So first, the Spirit of the Lord lifted him up and brought him to the entrance of the gateway of the inner court. And what does he see there? Uh, the image of jealousy. Uh, this image of jealousy, which it seems like the people are worshiping. They're worshiping an idol. Uh, right outside of the temple. But Yahweh says, hey, you know what? You're going to see still greater abominations than this. Goes to another part of the temple. This is the entrance of the court. And what does he see there? Vile abominations that are engraved on the walls of the temple itself. Yahweh says, eh, I'm not done yet. You're going to see still greater abominations that these people are committing in this city. I'm going to go to the entrance of the north gate, and women are going to be weeping for this fertility god. Tammuz. And then the final section, we see 25 men are worshiping the sun, uh, which faces east. Now, what is Yahweh going to do? How is he going to respond to all of his people worshiping idols in his city right before his own temple? Well, he is going to pack his bags and leave. This is a, a critically important and tragic moment in the book of Ezekiel. Look at chapter 8, verse 6. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they're doing, these great abominations, in order to drive me from my sanctuary? You, with your abominations, you are forcing me out of my temple. This critical moment. I mean, remember the, the covenant formula, the, the Mosaic covenant formula? I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will dwell in your midst. Well, for the first time in 850 years, that will no longer be true. Yahweh's going to leave his temple. The covenant is broken. And these chapters, especially um, chapter uh, 10 and 11, are going to record the progressive departure 
of the glory of Yahweh uh, out of his temple and out of Jerusalem. Look at this, um, this departure. Let's jump over to a chart, which I kind of got it all described here. The glory of God departs from the temple. Now, the glory of Yahweh, it was above the cherubim. Remember, God is seated above the cherubim. That is the Ark of the Covenant, got a couple of cherubs on top of it, and the, that's the throne of God, and his glory rests above those cherubim. But look what it says, Ezekiel 9, um, that the glory of Yahweh went up. It lifted up from above the cherubim in the Holy of Holies, and it moved to the threshold of the house. It went to the door of the temple. And then the glory of the Lord went up from the threshold. Here we are in chapter 10, and it stood above the, the mobile cherubim. Remember his little throne chariot, which can move all around. It's going to go now from the door of the temple. Now we're above mobile uh, throne chariot. And then these cherubim, um, they're going to go up from the threshold and they're going to go to the east gate. Now we've left, left the temple itself and now we're going to the outside gate of the whole temple complex. And of course, the glory of the Lord is above the cherubim. And then the cherubim are going to lift up their wings again um, and they're going to start moving and it's going to go up and it's going to get, leave the city. Now we're going outside of Jerusalem in 1123 and then it's going to go um, east of the city to the mountain that is east of the city, that is the Mount of Olives. The glory of the Lord is leaving the city and it's heading east. It's heading east. Now, why is it going east? Well, I think that's because Ezekiel, I mean, the guy seems really intense and hardcore, but he's a softy. Um, Ezekiel is a softy. He won't leave us hanging with this utter hopelessness of an empty temple, the presence of God leaving. Um, he's going to give us a little bit of hope uh, in chapter 11. Look at this, 11 verse 16. Look at this hope that Ezekiel presents to us. 11, 16. Though I remove them far from among the nations, and though I scatter them among the countries, yet I have been a sanctuary to them in the countries where they have gone. I've been a sanctuary there. Um, that's, that's what explains why Ezekiel can see the glory of God by the Kebar Canal, which is in Babylon, because Yahweh is a sanctuary for his faithful remnant um, in exile. And then look what it says, uh, this, the last few verses of chapter 11, I will gather you from the peoples um, and I will bring you back to the land. I will give this remnant, which returns to the land, a new heart and a new spirit I will put within them, remove their heart of stone, give them a heart of flesh that they can walk in all of my statues and obey them. I mean, this is amazing, but you got to slow down there, buddy. Slow down, Ezekiel. We have a whole lot more judgment before we can get to the restoration of chapters 34 to 48. And so in chapter 12, Ezekiel is going to get back to work. Um, and the poor guy, he's still mute. So he's going to perform these sign acts and he's only going to speak when Yahweh opens his mouth to do so. And this section, the second section of judgment in 12 to 24 is bracketed by two sign acts in chapter 12 and chapter 24. Now in chapter 12, Ezekiel is going to pack his bags, he's going to put on a big backpack, and he's going to start digging through a wall. And he's saying, this is what the, um, the people who are besieged in Jerusalem, this is what they're going to do. They're going to try to escape from Babylon as Babylon is breaking through the walls. They're going to be like, oh, get away, break through the walls. Um, so that's sign act number one at the uh, first section of the opening of this section of judgment. The final sign act in, in chapter 24 is, is horrible. Um, God says, your wife is going to die tomorrow. She's going to die tomorrow. And I'm telling you, you are not allowed to mourn for her death. Isn't that awful? And this is going to be a sign to the people. And, and, and why, why would God do this? What is he trying to communicate? Well, he tells us uh, here in chapter 24, and um, I want to draw attention to that by looking at the parallels between these two uh, brackets of this judgment section. Let's look at these two um, sections side by side. Okay, let's try to do this here. We got 
Chapter 24 is going to live down here, and chapter 12 is going to live up here. 12 1, thank you very much. Need you to be a little bit smaller, please. That should do. Okay, look at the parallels between these two sections. So, first off, um, Ezekiel is going to perform this sign act, and the people are going to ask, Why? What are you doing? They ask. Same question um, here in chapter 24. Will you not tell us what these things mean? Why are you acting in this way? And God says, Ezekiel, I have made you a sign. You are a sign. Ezekiel, look at this. I have made you a sign for the house of Israel. In both 12 and 24, Ezekiel shall be a sign to you. And then he tells us why. As I have done to Ezekiel, so I will do to the people of Judah. Now, what does this mean? Well, Ezekiel, in the same way that I took from you the delight of your eyes when your, when your wife died, so I will take away the delight of their eyes, the city of Jerusalem, the temple, the delight of their eyes, I will take from them. So that's pretty hard. Well, those are the outer sections of 12 to 24, and the content um, in between is, is a smattering of different literary uh, genres um, and literary uh, tools, um, the first of which is parables. Now, do you remember um, when the disciples asked Jesus, Jesus, why do you speak in parables? Well, the elders in, uh, in exile, they're going to ask Ezekiel the same thing. Ezekiel, why do you speak in parables? Check this out. Let's, let's jump now to chapter 17. Okay, I think we're done with you, and we want to go to chapter 17. And you could be a little bit bigger. It's okay. <clears throat> Son of man, God tells Ezekiel, I want you to speak a parable to the house of Israel. Propound to them a riddle. Um, and the people are going to say to you later in chapter 20, um, God, or Ezekiel says to God, Oh, Lord God, they are saying of me, is he not a maker of parables? Now, the point of all of these parables that Ezekiel communicates to the um, elders in Babylon is that Judah, Judah has rebelled, and Judah's judgment is inevitable. It is coming, and it's coming fast. So with these parables, Ezekiel is going to subvert the traditional image of Judah. So let's Take our mind back to the book of Genesis, um, Jacob's blessing. In Genesis 49, um, what is Judah called? Uh, wh what animal? He is the lion of Judah. And he's also described in that chapter as a fruitful vine. Well, Ezekiel is going to turn that image upside down here in these parables. So in chapter 15, he says, Judah, you are not a fruitful vine. No, you are a useless vine. You are a burnt vine. You can't build anything with a vine, it's only good for throwing in the fire. That's who you are. And then in chapter 17, a couple chapters later, he's going to carry this image forward again. He's going to say, okay, Judah, you are a vine. And, and a, a little branch is, is going to come up from the top of that vine. And then an eagle, an eagle is going to swoop in. He's going to grab that branch, rip it off from the vine, and carry it off to Babylon. Now, who do you think that eagle is? That eagle is Nebuchadnezzar, and that branch that he took to um, Babylon is Jehoiachin in 597. Um, and then this vine, this vine which is Judah, um, it's going to turn. It's going to turn to another eagle, the eagle of Egypt. He's going to be like, Egypt, please water me. Let's be friends. Um, and then what's the first eagle going to do? The eagle of Babylon. That eagle's going to say, hey, you're my vine, you're my vassal. And the eagle's going to swoop in, and he's going to uproot the vine of Judah. Um, again, that's the, the massive exile and destruction of the city in 586. Aren't these fascinating parables that Ezekiel tells? Well, he's going to tell the same story in chapter 19, but this time Judah isn't a vine. Judah is a lion or a lioness. And this lioness has a cub, and this cub is going to be caught in a net. Rawr, it's caught in a net, and it's going to be this time Egypt that's going to haul that lion, that lion cub, down to Egypt. That's referring to Jehoahaz, the, the, the king of Judah who is taken down to Egypt. I think that's around 609, 605. Well, then the lioness is going to have another cub, 
But this time, this cub is going to be caught in the net of Babylon and, of course, taken to Babylon. And it's kind of uh, difficult to tell. Are we talking about Jehoiachin or are we talking about Zedekiah with his second cub? Um, but regardless, the, the message is basically the same. Um, the most notable of Ezekiel's parables um, come in chapters 16 and 23, two parables about um, Judah as an f- unfaithful bride, um, a, a woman, uh, a wife who cheats on Yahweh, her husband. And, and uh, chapter 16 is actually the longest oracle in the entire uh, Bible. <laughs> I think it's 63 verses. It's a long chapter, and it follows um, this, this woman from her birth when she's abandoned. And then Yahweh rescues her and, and nurtures her and makes her beautiful. And when she's of age, Yahweh marries this woman. But then she uh, just begins cheating on him with guy after guy after guy after guy, cheating on him constantly. Um, and that's the story of the unfaithful bride here. And, and, and the purpose of these chapters, it's, it's actually quite interesting. Ezekiel is seeking to uh, deconstruct Judah's national narrative. They think um, Judah and and Israel, it is just a story of our rise to power and our rise to greatness. That's what we're destined for. But Ezekiel says, no, uh, the story of Israel is not one of a rise to greatness. No, it is one of a descent into rebellion. It is a rebellious house and into destruction. That is your story. That is your cultural um, history. And, which is quite unique in Ezekiel, he is going to say that rebellion, it began way back in Egypt. Um, None of the other prophets really emphasize this, but Ezekiel says, no, your rebellion, Judah, it began even before the Exodus, back in Egypt. Look where he makes this point in chapter 23. Your rebellion began in Egypt. Um, There you played the whore in Egypt, worshiping these Egyptian gods back in your youth. Um, She did not give up her whoring that she began in Egypt. Verse 19, she increased her whoring yet more and remembering the days of her youth when she played the whore in Egypt. Well, this this same deconstructive story that Ezekiel um, initiates in chapter 16, he's going to Uh, continue um, in chapter 20, but this time not as a parable, but as a case study. So um, Ezekiel is going, in these case studies, it's chapter 14, 18, and 20 most prominently, Ezekiel is going to act as a lawyer, and he's going to argue the case for God, defending God's um, abandonment of his temple and his destruction of the city of Jerusalem. And he's going to try to get the Judeans to change their thinking. Their thinking is all wrong. So in chapter 20, the elders are going to come to uh, Ezekiel, who is a hermit in his little house, right? They're going to come to Ezekiel in order to inquire of Yahweh. They're going to be like, we've got a question for Yahweh. We want to know when we're going home. And and Yahweh says through Ezekiel, takes off his little thing around his mouth, and he says, I will not be inquired of by you. And then he retells the story of Israel as just one long, repetitive cycle of Israel's rebellion and then God's forbearance. And then Israel's rebellion and God's forbearance and rebellion and forbearance until the present moment. Um, You see these these elders in uh, Babylon and those who remain in Judah, they are just entrenched in this self-deception. And they require a severe shock in order to wake them up um, to reality. And it turns out that that a severe shock happens to be Ezekiel's specialty. Now, I really like the way that Old Testament scholar Christopher Wright has described this, this rhetoric of Ezekiel. Take a look at this quote. I think he, he nails it here. Okay, so the rhetoric of Ezekiel. Now, we must bear in mind the terrible task that faced Ezekiel, the most traumatic catastrophe that ever happened to his people, the destruction of the city and the massive exile of all of its people. Now, his audience, um, they were obsessed with a total wrong interpretation of that catastrophe. 
they thought they didn't deserve it at all. They were innocent. And they also um, assumed that in our exile, it's going to be over soon. We're going to come back to Jerusalem and everything's going to be great. That's not the case. Um, and the only way to counter this misconception was to shatter them ruthlessly on the hard rocks of reality and share just with blatant um, offensive language the long history of their offense to Yahweh. Um, and <laughs> he's going to do this with another case study in chapter 18. This one's pretty well known. And he's like, okay, um, you think that um, this is what the elders in exile say. They say, we're just being punished because of the sins of our father. We're innocent. It's our fathers who sin. They're probably thinking of Manasseh, and that guy really did sin. Um, but Ezekiel says, this is not true. Let me present a case study for you. Um, take this scenario. A, a righteous father, I think maybe this is David, possibly, King David. A righteous father has a son. That son is wicked. Um, and this son then has another son, and, and his son, we'll say the grandson, generation three, is righteous. And Yahweh says through Ezekiel, that righteous grandson will not be punished for the sins of his father. No, the soul who sins shall die. Um, God says, um, I am just, I will not punish you for the sins of your father. You see, you think, um, elders in exile, you think you are righteous generation number three. You think you're the grandson. Let me tell you the truth. No, you are wicked, sinful generation number two, and your exile is deserved. You are as sinful as your fathers. Well, inherent in this case study is the principle that if there is a generation who repents, that generation will live. Now, we are going to pursue this promise of life in chapters 34 to 48, but first we have to turn our attention to Judah's neighbors in 25 to 32 next. <laughs> 